kind of Bible question do you have? What subject is of concern to you? Well, this is a program designed to offer you the opportunity to call in and ask questions or comments relating to the Bible. Our host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann, will respond by going to the Bible, the infallible Word of God. Our program is hosted Monday through Friday beginning at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, except Wednesdays when the program begins at noon Eastern. Call our toll-free number at 888-969-9883. Again, that's 888-969-9883. There will be someone there to answer your call and give you simple instructions to be on the program. You can also join us through Zoom video by going to ebiblefellowship.org and clicking the icon at the top. If you're calling in from another country, on our website select the toll free button to find your country's number. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to eBible Fellowship's new open forum program. During this time, we're going to open up the phone lines to take your call, and each person is invited to give us a call if you have a question or a comment you like to make. And I'll try to respond by going to the Bible, which is the Word of God. And the Bible uh, is our guide. Uh, that's how. Uh, also, we follow Christ. Christ is the Word. And, of course, the Bible is the Word. So as we learn truth from the Bible, as we um, learn uh, right doctrine, we follow it. And in doing so, we are taking up our cross and following the Lord. We're following Christ. Uh, and uh, typically, when when uh, we do follow the truth of the Bible, there will be affliction or tribulation that results for the word's sake and, and the suffering of living the Christian life is a result of following the word of God, the Bible, following that path, uh, that truth that the Lord has revealed to us. And then... Um, uh, you know, normally there will be tribulation as a result. Well, okay, um, we're just going to get started by going to the first person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our new open forum program. Please go ahead with your call. Yeah, hi, Chris. Uh, Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2. I'll have you read it, and then I have a comment again. Matthew 7, verse 2, verses. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Yeah, uh, I know God is telling the elect we're not to judge, but could it also be implying what goes around comes around. And I'll take your response, Chris. Thanks. Well, that, that's a saying, you know, that the people of the world have. When someone does something that is uh, unkind or even cruel, uh, and, and then something comes back on that person later, they, they say what goes around comes around. Now, the Bible says you reap what you sow. And, and that, that goes for sowing iniquity, you know, um, being, um, uh, uh, you know, cruel or, or um, um, being mean to others rather than trying to be kind to them. Uh, or, or, you know, there is a whole host of various sins that people do to one another. And, um, and it's just living one's life. We're either going to live a life that is following Christ, following the Word of God, or we'll live a life following 
our own lusts, our own desires, the way of the world. And um, and and so, yeah, yeah, the um, things do come back on people. And uh, one one characteristic of uh, an unsafe person is is uh, judgment. That is judgment in the sense of judging others. Um, I I've known a bunch of people that once someone crossed them, once someone did something, you know, they they really didn't like, they um, they wiped them off their list. That's it for that individual. I'm not going to be his friend. I'm not going to uh, even greet him or or you know he's I've heard people say he's dead to me. Um, you know, men are the cruelest judges. They're the harshest judges of others. And it, 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 sometimes uh, people look to the child of God and and say, we are, um, you know, uh, doing something, we're judging um, due to the things that we teach. And no, no, we're, we're not judging them personally, individually. We're not pointing the finger at any one person. But we are judging the word of God. Uh, we're, we're making determinations, judgments by the grace of God as the Spirit of God directs us and leads us into truth. Uh, we, we come to understand various verses and, and the things they teach. And uh, of course, this time of the end, there has been judgments the Bible has brought forth upon those in the churches and congregations, and upon those in the world, um, as far as God leaving the church and, and no longer saving within it, and, and now as far as God shutting the door of heaven and no longer saving anyone in the world, and, and we uh, have made a judgment um, concerning the truthfulness of these things, you know, that's what wisdom is, really. Wisdom is, is um, making a judgment on a verse, on a passage, on a chapter, and so forth. And, and uh, the judgment that the Lord has opened up to our understanding is, yes, it's judgment day. God is actively judging the inhabitants of the world. We, the people of God, are participating in that judgment process by sharing these things. But again, we um, I know I, I um, do not want to point to any person, any individual, and say, well, uh, you are under the wrath of God or, or um, you know, God is raining down fire and brimstone on your head. No, no, it, it, it's all, um, you know, we, we declare things. Um, as far as the Bible reveals, the door shut, and of course there is a whole lot of consequence to that doctrine, and people certainly will feel judged by it, but it's not coming from the child of God. It, it's not coming from us at all. God says he shuts and opens doors, and no one else. Uh, he, he's the one in control of that. But thank you for calling and sharing. Excuse me? No, thank you. Oh, okay. Well, thank <laughs> you for calling and sharing. And let's go now to the next person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Can you read Mark chapter 15, verses 35 through... 37, please. Okay, Mark 15, starting in verse 35. And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he, call, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone. 
Let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Did Jesus drink the vinegar? And was that poison that killed him? No, no, that, that didn't kill him. Um, actually, he gave up the ghost. It, it was, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's God. And it's always God who comes to take the spirit away from a person in death. Um, yes, the person could fall off a building, and and when they hit the ground, they're they're going to die. But it's God who who takes the spirit, and that's the official um, moment of death. Once the spirit leaves the body, then a person is dead, and that's why you know when people uh, they they talk about after death experiences. They were dead for so long and came back. Well, no, no. Uh, only in the Bible uh, are there those found who did die. And then the Lord restored their spirit and they came back to life. But as far as since the Bible has been completed, people, uh, people die. And at the point of the spirit being taken from them, once that happens, it never goes back. So... The individuals who who think they died, they they never really did die. Um, but as, as far as the vinegar, um, one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And um, let's see, is that is that in Matthew two? Matthew. Matthew 27. And in verse uh, 48, and straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. So it, it, it doesn't say that he drank. Um, I, I, you know, would like to see all the accounts. I'm not sure if it's in every gospel. Um, Luke 23. Does it, does it speak of that there? I don't think I don't think it does. And let's see what John says. John. <clears throat> John 19. Um, we read in verse. No, the, I don't. Oh, yeah, here it is. John 19 in verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So it's not, um, it says he received the vinegar, um, but that that doesn't necessarily mean he drank of it. They put it on a sponge and they put it to his lips. Um, and and he received it in that sense, as I think that was foretold by the Lord in uh, Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, um, is it there or Psalm 69? In verse Psalm 69, 21, they gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. 
And um, the the word goal uh, is translated uh, as poison. It, it's Strong's number uh, seventy two nineteen, um, and and um, in, in Job twenty verse sixteen, he shall suck poison, and that's referring to the wicked. Or in Deuteronomy 32, 32, 33, uh, I think it refers to the goal. Well, let's let's check it out. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 32. For their vine is the vine of Sodom, and of the fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of Ass. The word venom is the same word as gall. Uh, so the 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 word gall is definitely poisonous, and I, it does look like it's a Hebrew parallelism. The first part, they gave me gall for my meat, and in my thirst, vinegar to drink. Um, so, uh, but but um, yeah, I, I that definitely did not kill him. Um, Remember when the Roman soldiers came to break his legs uh, because they didn't want um, anyone crucified or hanging on, on a cross for the Sabbath, and, and they marveled that he had already died. So the Lord accomplished the purpose of the demonstration of the atonement, and then he declared, it is finished. He gave up the ghost, so he willingly, um, his spirit went into paradise, uh, and and uh, the body was put in the tomb after that. But uh, yeah, uh, really, um, not even the crucifixion killed him. It, it was the uh, the will of God Himself. Uh, that okay, I I I have done all that I intended to do in coming to Earth and and uh, illustrating the atonement, and now that it's finished, I will I will leave the body, and and then the demonstration continues with the resurrection. Um, you know, after the the three days and three nights. But thank you for a very good question. And let's go to the next person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hey, Chris. Um, I have a question, uh, or I found something interesting that I have a question about. Um, uh, can you go to Ezra 2.10? Okay. Ezra 2. <clears throat> The children of Bani, 640 and 2. Now, the parallel count in Nehemiah, it mentions Benui with a similar number. Um, 648, yeah. Yeah, 648. Now, I was looking around, and uh, if you go to, can you read Nehemiah 9, verses 4? Nehemiah 9, 4? Yeah. Then stood up upon, then stood up upon the stairs of the Levites, Jeshua, and Bani, Cadmiel, Shebaniah, Buni, Sherebiah, Bani, and Chenani, and cried with a loud voice unto Jehovah their God. Now you'll notice in this verse there's two ba uh, Banis that are mentioned. The one right before Cadmiel, and then the one right after uh, Sherebiah. Um, so I'm wondering if those are two separate um, people. Because why why would it be mentioned twice if they're all standing up? And then if I have kind of more proof of this, if you go to Ezra 10. Well, verses... yeah, but this, uh, you know, Nehemiah is uh, some period of time after after um, Zerubbabel and, and all Israel or all the captives came out of Babylon and were reckoned according to genealogy. You, you know what I mean? The this Nehemiah is happening decades later 
and and so men who are alive then aren't necessarily the same ones oh, I who see. are recorded in the genealogy. Well, in Ezra, um, if you go to Ezra 10, verses 29. Ezra 10, 29. Mm -hmm. And of the sons of Bani, Meshulam, Malak, and Adaiah, Jeshub, and Sheel, and Ramoth. All right, and then in verse, if you go down to verse 34. 34, the sons of Bani, Ma'ad, Madiai, Emrim, and Uel. So it appears that this, uh, in verse 34, that this is another Bani, because it's he's mentioning three different sons. Mm -hmm. um, and then in verse 38, if you just read that last verse. And Bani and bin, Binui, Shimei. Yeah, so this this uh, third Bani that's mentioned is a son of this other Bani. So you have, so verse 29, you have, we call him Bani 1. Verse 34, uh, you have this other Bani, which has three different names. And then in this uh, verse 38, it's a son of the second Bani. Um, and he also had a son, this third Bani had a son named Benui. Well, so, um... <laughs> That appears there's uh, I, three. Uh... I, I have a, to me, I don't think you're clearing it up. <laughs> yeah, no, it's making the mystery deeper, actually. It's not clearing yeah, it up. Well, well, uh, yeah. I mean, this is what has to happen. Yeah. A whole bunch of looking at it, um, because there's a lot of names, a lot of numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh I I think uh, just just prayer, just prayer. Um uh, the truth is we we won't learn or know anything unless God's um, going to reveal it to us. And and God reveals things according to his will, uh, like, like uh, Luke 24 tells us in verse 45, then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And... You know, that was opening uh, in the first century. And and they they did increase knowledge, increase understanding. And then God opened up the understanding of his people at the time of the end of the church age, in the great tribulation into judgment now. And he he will reveal secret things. Secret things. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto Jehovah our God. Uh, but uh, let's go back there. Make sure I quote it right. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The secret things belong unto Jehovah our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. So God has, you know, all the wisdom and knowledge um, that is all secret. It's all secret because only he uh, knows truth and, and knows about himself and knows his plans. So that's how it starts off. When, when the Lord first created the world, he possessed all knowledge, and now he creates the world. And he begins to reveal, even through the creation, you know, the the sun, moon, and stars are they give testimony uh, to all inhabitants of the earth, and especially through divine revelation, he began to give the Bible. But as we know, even the Bible, though it is the book of the revelation of God, is full of secret things because it's written in mysteries, in parables. God verily is a God who hides himself, and um, it, it, it's according to his glory to conceal a matter, and it's the honor of kings to search it out. And uh, so we, we get involved in that process, and we've, by God's grace, really uncovered just an enormous amount of information over the last uh, several decades, uh, just just tremendous amounts 
of spiritual information that that was hidden. It, it was um, in the form of parables, and and the Lord's brought it forth. Um, you know, there's there's a good verse in Matthew 11, a good, um, actually a good passage that that helps us a lot. Matthew 11, verse 25, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent. <clears throat> and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. It, you say this language, no man knows, in the context of hidden truth, secret things, and in the context of God revealing the secret things. And, um, and, and he reveals them to babes. I think the reference here, the wise and the prudent, has to do with the, the uh, church, leader, historically, the church leaders of Israel. They, they were the so-called wise men, they, they were the ones uh, who had the, the training. They were the learned ones, supposedly. And we could identify that with those in the churches and congregations, the, the scholars, the theologians, you know, who write the commentaries. Well, God has hidden a great deal from them. And it, it's according to the will of God to reveal them to babes. To, to babes, to his people, um, you know, who, who of ourselves were nothing, were nothing. We, uh, you know, I, I think it's really something um, uh, uh, with E-Bible Fellowship, you know, with our, our housetops programming, um, I think you can, even though we just started, we just started, uh, I, I know that. But I think you can right now put up uh, all the teachers that are teaching on house to our housetops, compare it to the teachers who taught in years past on Family Radio Echoes, uh, for a number of them, the, the pastors especially, and you'll see uh, much better teaching in the sense of uh, really uh, getting right to the meat of the word, looking for the spiritual meaning. Um, it, and and e-Bible fellowships teachers are not trained. They're not trained. They're, they're just, uh, you know, regular guys. And, and yet the Lord has been instructing us diligently um, with Family Radio, with the Open Forum, Mr. Camping, and it's continued over these years since May 21, 2011. The Lord just keeps instructing us and, and showing us the proper biblical methodology, giving us the Spirit as a guide, guiding us into truth, and information just keeps flowing forth from the Bible. And uh, I, uh, you know, of course, that has a lot to do with it too. Um, you know, that, that we're living at that time when God has determined to uh, to reveal the revelation of His righteous judgment and uh, just so so much information, and basically, uh, it, it's kind of hard to to uh, not receive it, to to not see it, um, because uh, the Lord has opened up the eyes of our understanding to these things. Mm -hmm. There is there is one last thing, um, if you don't mind, I just wanted to point out, um, and it doesn't help, <laughs> it just adds more to the mystery, but uh, there's actually, it seems like there's two Benu eyes as well, because if you go to Ezra 10, verses 30. Ezra 10, 30. 
and of the sons of Pehath, Moab, Ad, Adna, and Shelo, Benaniah, Maasiah, Mataniah, Bezalel, and Benui, and Manasseh. And then verse 38. And Bani, and Benui, and Shimei. Yeah, so it appears that this Bani is a brother to this Benui, whereas the other Benui is uh, just some, you know, unrelated. So it's um, just comparing the two accounts, you wonder. Yeah. Who, who well, you know, the, uh, the, the Israelites tended to, um, you know, name, name their children after their previous generations. Remember when John the Baptist was born and uh, they asked um, Zacharias finally, what, what will the child's name be? And he said, his name is John. And that's, that's when he began uh, to speak again. And, and they said, well, none of thy kindred is named after, after that name. So it, it was, it was very typical for generations of Jews to, to um, use um, patriarchal names. I mean, we see, uh, um, you know, Joseph and Mary. Joseph's father was Jacob, and uh, and 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 so uh, it it's it's got to be more than names um, uh, that that helps us to tie things down and and get an understanding. If we're going to get an understanding, yeah. um, you know, that's in the Lord's hands. But thank we'll you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, was there something else? No, I was just saying maybe that I, I thought maybe that would help with um not that it would, it helps us, but maybe to see that we shouldn't view them as the same, you know, like the Baney, there's it seems like we have three options from Ezra. So maybe God leads us to figure out which of the three it could be. Maybe it would help it to make more sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for of uh, sharing and let's go now to the next person on the phone tonight welcome to our open forum program please go ahead with your call hi chris how are you i'm doing well thank you please go ahead with your question i have a two questions if i may ask the first one is ezekiel and jeremiah uh were like coexist at the same time Ez ezekiel was in uh, babylon and jeremiah was in judah Based on the uh, verse, uh, Ezekiel, verse uh, chapter 1, verse 2. Yeah, let, let's take a look at that. I was just going to turn there. Ezekiel 1, 2. Uh, well, well, Ezekiel 1, 1. Uh, now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Chebar, that the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity. We know the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity was 593 B.C., which makes the first verse statement in the 30th year kind of curious um, because the, the um, 70 year period of Judah's tribulation began in 609 upon the death of Josiah, and 593 would be, um, let's see, nine, 16 years, about, uh, depending on how you count, it, it, it would be 16 years, nowhere near 30. So what's the reference to the 30th year? And that's the first thing that you have to understand with Ezekiel, is that God is actually um, reckoning from the days of Josiah, when the book of the law was found, and that was about 622, 623 BC. We uh, we know that Josiah um was he he was born, he yeah, he was born in 640, he was born in 640 BC, and it was in his 18th year that they found the book of the law. And that would have been, again, depending on how you count 622, 623. 
and 593 is 30 years from that point. So uh, that that's interesting. And um, right away, uh, we, we can see why, because the finding of the book of the law has to do with, uh, with the, the unsealing of the word at the time of the end during the Great Tribulation. And um, they, they, they had lost God's word. And when it's when the, the Bible was lost, of course they couldn't read it, just like when the Bible's sealed, you can't read it. And and then once they found it, they could read it. And they did read it, and that sparked Josiah's reform. You know, uh, he he read it, he uh he was shocked at, at what God had said, and he went about cleaning up all Judah. But um, that that also, um, let's see, if you go from, say, 623 B.C., the finding of the Book of the Law, if we use that date, till 539 B.C., and 539 is the 70th year of the 70-year tribulation, well, um, from 539 from 600 is 61 years, and then... 623, 23 years from 600, so you have 23 plus um, 61, and, and that's 84. So from the point of finding the book of the law until the whole 70-year span is over with is, is 84 years, and 84 is the number of tribulation. We, we know the three and a half days, 84 hours, seven years of famine in Joseph's day, uh, seven times 12 months is 84 months. And, and there's other, other figures too. Um, and, and also the breakup of that, 23 years until 600, 61 years thereafter, uh, we, we have the actual 23-year Great Tribulation broken up, 2,300 days, plus 6,100 days for a total of 8,400 days in, in the exact 23 years. So that, that's the first thing, and this tells us that, yes, Ezekiel was, um, uh, he, he was prophesying the same time as Jeremiah, uh, although uh, later, later, uh, it, Jeremiah tells us, uh, I think it's Jeremiah 25. If we go to Jeremiah 25, uh, we we read in verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, um, that would be 605 B.C., the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, from the thirteenth year of Josiah, and again, Josiah began to reign 640, so Jeremiah began to prophesy in 627 B.C., from the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, and this would be again, um, 605. So from 627, it, it's amazing how 23 and 84 pops up. 627 to 605 inclusive is 23 years. And in the book of Jeremiah has everything to do with God's judgment, God's, you know, end time tribulations. Uh, so from the 13th year of Josiah, 627, even unto this day, which is um, 605, uh, uh, perhaps 604, the word of Jehovah has come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. And even the reference to the 13th year, the 13th year of Josiah. Josiah could be a type of Christ. The 13th year of Christ. 13,000 years of history, 1988, and the time of the church, the end of the church age, and that's when, 
you know, 2,300 evening mornings in 23 years um, of the judgment on the church uh, began. Thank you, Chris. Um, my other question is Jeremiah chapter 31, verse uh, 22. 42? No, Jeremiah 31, verse 22. 22, okay. <clears throat> Jeremiah 31, 22. How long wilt thou go about, O thou backsliding daughter? For Jehovah has created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. Yeah, I'm trying to understand what is God teaching us? A woman shall compass man. I don't understand uh, that parable. Well, um, the, the, the word for woman isn't the normal word, not the usual word. The usual word, <clears throat> excuse me, the usual word is The the usual word is um, Strong's eight oh two, and this is fifty three forty seven. Uh, this word is normally translated as female. Um, so a, a a female shall compass a man, and man here I believe is Geber. Um, that that's in the word uh, Gabriel. Uh, you know, um, so. It, 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 that also would not be the usual word for man, like Adam. Um, uh, there, there's other, you know, more commonly used words for man. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure of the spiritual meaning. Um, well, we know the first part. It is the Lord speaking to his apostate people, and and. Um, the word apostasy means to forsake the law, and God defines that in the New Testament, uh, you know, where we, we read in 2 Thessalonians 2, there will come a falling away first, and the, the Greek word uh, apostasia is translated falling away, and it's only used one other place in the book of Acts uh, where they have forsaken Moses. And Moses is a figure of the law. So to forsake the law is apostasy. And uh, Old Testament Judah did forsake the law. And New Testament churches and congregations have forsaken the law that, that is being obedient to the law of God, the Bible. And, and so that is uh, identified as backsliding. Uh, o thou backsliding daughter, for Jehovah has created a new thing in the earth, a woman shall compass a man. I don't know. I don't know the spiritual meaning. I'm sorry. But thank you for uh, calling and sharing. Uh, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, we have no other callers on the line, so we'll end our program here. Um, thank you for joining us, whether listening at home or on Zoom. Uh, of course, if you're on Zoom, you can also be at home. Well, uh, listening over the airwave or or on Zoom. However, you be you you joined us. We're glad you did. Lord willing, we'll have another open forum program tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. But for now, may you have a good night, and may the Lord's perfect will. Be done. Thanks again for joining us for eBible Fellowship's live open forum program. You can call in with your Bible questions Mondays and Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays beginning at 6 p.m. Eastern and Wednesdays beginning at noon Eastern.